Hi, good evening, everyone. Hi, Dr. John Santana here, Dr. Nabi over there. Uh, we're here at the Michigan Center for Regenerative Medicine. Thank you again for joining us in our monthly webinar. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about regenerative medicine procedures for knees and hips. We've covered this topic before, but we figure it's one of the most common things that we see. It'll be a good time to review it. Yeah, it's uh it's a it's a most common thing that we get people coming in for knees hips um, and uh, uh, there's a lot of new treatments that we've been doing since we talked about this last so we thought it'd be a good topic to revisit and yeah. um, I think we have some uh, really exciting stuff to talk about tonight yeah yeah I mean the most I think knees are the most common complaints that we see here in the office right and then uh, hips I think it's like within our top five that we see here in the office especially now that people are more active they do a lot of things outdoors very common issues to see. So Dr. Navi, what do you think is the most common knee issue that you see day to day? Um, so osteoarthritis would be the number one yep. thing that brings people in with uh, their knee, knee complaints. Um, arthritis is such a, a general term. It can mean so many different things to, to different people, uh, but essentially it's wear and tear. It's the effect of gravity on our joints uh, uh, over time. So uh, use, um, activity, and uh, um, Genetics definitely play a, a role in yep. uh, developing osteoarthritis. Um, diagnosis is not that difficult. Uh, most of the time, uh, the symptoms, general aching, especially in the morning, uh, nighttime pain after a, a busy day, pain right. oftentimes gets better with activity, but um, also at the end of like long walks or standing for long periods of time, pain can get worse. So those symptoms being extremely common. X-ray is oftentimes a, a simple and, and easy way to confirm the suspected diagnosis. Uh, but a lot of times we'll want to order MRIs as well because there's certain findings on an MRI that can help us determine what type of procedure um, would be best, what exactly structures need to be injected. Um, not all uh, forms of osteoarthritis have the same uh, treatment protocol, so we want to uh, make sure that we're uh, addressing each individual patient um, and their specific structural needs. Yep, and, and yeah, like, like you said too, it's always good to get the MRI because most of the times when the arthritis is severe enough, we see other issues starting to be affected too, right? So sometimes we see meniscus tears involved in that as well. Uh, sometimes some ligamentous issues too, some uh, defects in the cartilage that we see depending on if it's on the inside part of the knee or underneath the kneecap or on the outside part. And in more severe cases, we see something called so, uh, subchondral edema or bone marrow lesions, which sounds scary, but you know it's signs of severe degeneration and arthritis. Um, and can lead to further degradation of the bone over time if, if just left unchecked. So the knee is uh, a weight-bearing joint and uh, the, the articular surface. So if you think about the femur coming down and the, the cartilage that sits at the end of our femurs, um, hyaline cartilage or osteochondral cartilage, uh, same type of cartilage, different names, uh, but it's essentially it's the weight-bearing and shock-absorbing portion, portion of our knee. Uh, and over time, that can be worn down, such as that shock is not getting absorbed, um, and then that force gets uh, uh, propagated uh, in, inwards towards the bone. And that's where we see those bone marrow lesions or bone marrow edema um, as that bone is trying to absorb force that it's just not meant to absorb. Um, and that's very um, correlative to people with um, uh, osteoarthritic type knee pain. Yep. So. <clears throat> what are the treatments that you know that that we would recommend for somebody who comes in with osteoarthritis or something along those lines? Uh, and and PRP and stem cells, two great options for uh, knee pain that's coming from osteoarthritis. So uh, how do you determine, or when you're talking to a patient, how do you determine whether you think a PRP procedure or a stem cell procedure uh, would be more beneficial? Yeah. So it's it's a good question because it's it's a uh, it's one of these things where. Uh, it's not just a straight health question, right? So there's financial uh, implications to that as well. PRP is cheaper than bone marrow procedures and in usually bone marrow procedures, there's an added step of harvesting uh, stem cells, whether it's from your adipose or, or the bone marrow. So there's always that discussion. But in general, um, when, when I see patients with, you know, mild to moderate arthritis or more uh, ligamentous or, or tendon type issues like patellar tendonitis or ligamentous laxities like uh, MCL or LCL issues, meniscus tears that's not too severe. A lot of times PRP would be effective for those types of things also. Granted, they have you know mild to minimal arthritis. When we're talking about more severe type things, 
like you know grade three, grade four, moderate to severe osteoarthritis, then that's when I think stem cells have a better outcome of, uh, than, than PRP. Because especially if you use bone marrow stem cells the way that we harvest it here, we do get a portion of, with the stem cells with it, but also PRP because we get it from the bone marrow. So you're getting kind of the best of both worlds there uh, in that one procedure. So that's how I kind of start counseling patients. But again, there's different nuances to both. Either it's not a hard and fast rule, but it's something that, that I used to discuss with patients. Yeah, uh, uh, selecting the right product for the right diagnosis is a critical step in getting a good outcome. Uh, that diagnostic workup, uh, we alluded to x-rays, MRIs, physical exam, uh, matching those with patient symptoms. Uh, if the structures have a good blood supply, things like ligaments, tendons, everything Dr. Santana uh, <coughs> alluded to, PRP, um, not just in our opinion, but statistically as we uh, track our outcomes using our registry, uh, we can see almost equivalent outcomes, whether people use uh, stem cells or PRP. And uh, uh, in the world that regenerative medicine is right now, uh, being an out-of-pocket expense, we want to be very sensitive to the fact that um, patients are paying for this. And if, if you're going to get equal outcomes, and one significantly less expensive than the other, uh, why would we choose a less expensive option? So that's that's usually what we recommend. Um, we try to be very honest with our consultations. Uh, when we think PRP is gonna be equally effective as a, a stem cell procedure, we recommend the PRP. Um, there are conditions where PRP is not equal to, to stem cells, as Dr. Santana alluded to, when it's more um, cartilage that is on that bone surface, that osteochondral cartilage, that doesn't have a great blood supply. and uh, and utilizing bone marrow concentrate uh, stem cells or, or lipoaspirate fat derived stem cells uh, for those conditions statistically do significantly better than our uh, platelet rich plasma patients. So doing a great consult, doing the appropriate evaluation, selecting your patients and then advising the right product are two of the uh, critical steps in getting a, a satisfactory uh, optimal outcome. Um, that in, the third step in that is injection technique. Um, and one of the things we want to make sure we talk about tonight is, is where to put those uh, stem cells. If we're talking about an osteochondral type cartilage deficit, especially one that's starting to cause uh, bone marrow lesions, um, we're mm -hmm. utilizing intraosseous injections, subchondral injections, two terms that mean the same thing, which is essentially mm -hmm. injecting the cells underneath the bone uh, where the uh, cartilage cells get their nutrition, where they originate from, and then they migrate to the surface uh, where they then help uh, add to the to the cushion and to the uh, shock absorbing effect of the knee. Yep, and uh, one of the signs that, you know, usually when I listen to patients when we do these consults is, you know, they complain of, they have pain even when they're sleeping or laying down. So usually with arthritis, it's a weight bearing joint. Usually this one start feeling pain, but with patients that notice pain when they're sleeping, usually it's a sign for me that maybe they do have a subchondral uh, lesion or a bone marrow lesion for us to look into. Uh, so that's one of the things to look for. And then the MRI is really re revealing and looking at for these lesions. We're now more sensitive to it because now we have tools to actually treat it. Before, it's one of these things like, oh, man, you have a bone marrow lesion. Now what do we do? We just wait till you know, it gets really bad and then you get a knee replacement. I just pulled up a, a few articles on doing a intraosseous injections so or injections into the bone versus just injecting it into the joint itself. Um, uh, there's a review article that came up in 2021 kind of looking at intraosseous injections with orthobiologics, both PRP and stem cells. Um, with the PRP intraosseous procedure, one of the uh, published articles did show that uh, out of 14 patients in their study, only two patients ended up getting a total knee replacement. So that's, that's a pretty strong advocacy for PRP intraosseous. And then uh, for bone marrow concentrate intraosseous procedures, um, it was cited uh, that one, one group, six out of 10 patients had an average of about 23% increase in cartilage thickness on the MRI. Um, uh, another study showed a 4.2%. So they both showed improvements as far as you know, objective data looking at the MRI as well. So kind of goes over what Dr. Manny was saying, when we are able to deliver the nutrition and the healthy cells into the cartilage more efficiently by going through the bone, then the outcomes do improve than just putting it in the joint itself. Yeah, it's really nice to see the literature catching up to uh, what we've been seeing uh, empirically and what we've been doing for our patients now for over a year. Um, and uh, I, I do think over time, uh, the literature is going to absolutely support uh, that 
regenerative medicine, these types of procedures done, quote unquote, the right way um, are uh, going to be equal to, if not superior to what we currently consider to be uh, surgical type only treatable conditions. Uh, we have non-surgical treatments that um, the, that uh, two and our uh, rather 12 and 14 being successful are very analogous to the to these stats that we're getting mm-hmm. in tracking our patients outcomes. Um, we'll be the first to admit that not 100 percent of our patients are able to avoid surgery or, or do we get um, uh, uh, the pain relief and the functional outcomes that we're looking for. Um, but our statistics are, are uh, at approximately 85 percent, uh, which is uh, pretty darn good when you're looking at anything in medicine. Um, anybody who tells you that 100 percent of the time. Uh, it's going to work. It, it's probably not not speaking the truth to you, right? And then I guess the other advantage too with regenerative medicine is that when we do the treatments, and if it doesn't work, there's still the option for surgery and injections and nerve blocks. So it doesn't really narrow your treatment choices afterwards. Unfortunately, with surgeries and especially with knee replacements, which is the end point for a lot of the treatments, there's not really a lot of options outside of that um, if if that fails, and so it kind of makes it harder to treat for. And that's when you kind of fall into that pain management realm and, and uh, you're kind of talking about more chronic long-term management for those types of things. Um, so one of the questions I'll get a lot from, <clears throat> from patients is if uh, our injection techniques and our, our procedures work so well, um, why isn't everybody doing them and why aren't insurances covering them? Um, do you have answers to that questions when you get those? <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that, that's, that's a loaded question, but yeah, so uh, I guess the easy answer is that it's not covered by insurance. So I, that's that's the, probably the easiest way to answer that is uh, it's out of pocket. So it's kind of limiting as far as costs for some patients. Um, uh, of course, like insurance covered procedures, you're already paying into your insurance. It kind of makes sense to do that. You kind of just follow the normal algorithm of that too. But it's kind of like how I like, would, would phrase it. How would you? How would yeah, you? Uh, definitely with the insurance, it's a, I, I think it's a data driven um, decision. Uh, there's not enough data to support that um, all types of stem cells are, are effective. Um, doing it the quote unquote again right way, um, those three things, selecting patients, selecting the right product and doing the right procedure uh, is what's driving our outcomes. Um, I'm very optimistic that in the near future we will have that data to support and we'll start to get third party payers that uh, agree that not only is this the right thing for their um, patient base, but it's also the right thing for their pocketbook. Um, uh, regenerative procedures are way cheaper than surgery, and uh, when done properly, they work a statistically significant uh, 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 number of times. So uh, as good, if not better than surgery uh, for certain indications, and, and we're starting to drive that data uh, where that I think in the near future will be a, an option. Uh, but from a physician standpoint, why aren't more physicians doing it? Um, it is new, and it is a new technique, and it's something that wasn't taught during residency, during their fellowships. Is something that takes extra time to go out and do additional training, uh, extra equipment. Uh, you need uh, uh, C arms. You need uh, a good quality ultrasound machinery in order to see the uh, correct tissue targets. Um, not everybody wants to make that financial investment, especially when what they're currently doing is um, working for their their business model, their their current patient base, and and their clinic uh, to invest in new technology that's not covered by insurance that. Um, may or may not um, uh, work in the long run is is a risk that I, I just think a lot of physicians aren't willing to take yet. Um, yeah. You're looking at two that um, had the experience of treating patients, saw the outcomes, believed in what we were doing, and uh, decided to invest in in the future and in this in this realm. So really happy in what we built and, and the outcomes we've 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 established the the um, reputation I think that we've developed both amongst our physician colleagues as well as our our patients and, and those word of mouth referrals um, are now our biggest source. Yeah. Uh, just other people uh, either sending us a, a patient of theirs and, and having that patient have a great outcome. And now they um, are, are sending more patients or uh, patients who have had great outcomes telling their friends and family. So to our patients who are referring providers, we really appreciate the support. We really appreciate the confidence. And uh, we're happy to be able to do these things and, and share that knowledge um, uh, with whoever is uh, interested in, in learning these procedures. Um, it's a big hurdle to get over, and, and that's something that both Dr. Stanton and I have, have uh, thought long and hard about and, and now have programs available for physicians interested in, in incorporating these types of procedures into their practices. Um, really do believe this is the, the future of medicine, and it's not something that we'll be able to manage 
all the patients that could benefit from this. So we really do need um, additional support. We need additional people that um, uh, want to incorporate these sorts of things into what they're offering for their patients as well. And uh, it works. It, it, it's, uh, it's an extremely satisfying uh, practice to come to and to, uh, to be able to um, you know, share those outcomes and, and this knowledge with as many other uh, patients at this point who uh, would like to have us uh, evaluate and treat them. Yep. And then, then like, like I saw what you said, so our, it's a, we, we want to do it the right way. And, and the way that we teach regenerative medicine to other physicians is that we want to do it the right way too. So there's like with everything, there's shortcuts. And I think when you take the shortcuts, you can have short-term gains, but, but long-term, you know, it's, it's not really worth it. So um, it, it took us a while to kind of get to this point and we're willing to share that information uh, with anyone who's willing to 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 go through the the same difficulties and, and hurdles, we'll um, learn from our mistakes and and just pick up where we we know all the benefits are. Yeah, um, it's uh, uh, it's definitely effective um, uh, when done the right way, and I think if we do that the right way and teach other people to do it the right way, um, the third party payers, the insurance companies, will be more than happy to. To pay for these procedures, which are cheaper um, and uh, and get equal, if not better, outcomes than currently they're paying for. So, yeah, um, uh, we didn't talk about hips much. <laughs> I, I think we we definitely want to talk about hips and touch base on hips because uh, that's something that from the the time that we started doing these procedures in 2015 uh, to now, I think is probably the joint that's maybe had the biggest change in in uh, our outcomes. It, when I first started doing these, hips were probably the hardest joint to get a positive outcome. Our, our, yep. our stats on hips lag those on knees, shoulders, even the spine. Um, our hip patients, while we had certainly successful outcomes, were not at the percentages that those other joints were. Um, uh, Dr. Santana took the lead on, on uh, an injection technique that uh, has allowed us, I think, to um, uh, really improve our, our hip osteoarthritis outcome um, so I'd like you to, if you wouldn't mind, yeah, uh, kind of jump it on. So, you know, when, when we treat a hip patient, diagnostics, um, uh, patient evaluation, very similar to the knee. So really, the injection technique um, changes uh, when we're looking at the hip. Yeah. So before, like when we would uh, look into injections for the hip, we mainly just focus on the intraarticular part of it, so the, the joint and the socket portion of it. Um, now, knowing how we get results from the intraosseous procedures or the IO procedures. We're implementing more of the IO procedures for our hip procedures, and that's, I think, what the game changer was as far as finding our outcomes. The, with the hip being a more ball, ball and socket joint that has multiple ranges of motion, I think that way, doing it from intraosseous procedures kind of cover the hip a little bit better and get more coverage throughout the entire ball and the, the femur. And I, I, Probably want to say it's probably the biggest change that we did, and that's I would attribute that to the most tools that we have. Typically, for uh, ligamentous issues in the hips, that usually responds well, like greater trochanteric bursitis, labral tears, stuff like that. But the arthritis is the tough one, and, and doing the IO is definitely a, a game changer. And from uh, not to get too technical in the injection technique, but the, the IO procedure requires fluoroscope, fluoroscopic guidance, the machine sitting behind us. Um, and when you set the fluoroscope and the, and the position to safely um, drive the needle through the, the femoral head, um, it's, a, it's a procedure where you really need to be able to see the borders of your, uh, of your uh, uh, hip bones uh, to make sure you're safely keeping that, that needle going down the trajectory that it needs to. Um, and uh, Dr. Santana came up with a technique of uh, sideline and, and patient, placing the position and uh, patient in a position such that you're able to um, not have both the hips superimposed. When you're looking from, uh, if a patient's laying on their back and you're looking from the side, both hips are in the field of view with the x-ray machine, but by sideline and positioning one over the other, um, I can honestly say it's been a game changer for me and my ability to safely navigate and, and confidently navigate that, that uh, femoral neck. Uh, and uh, my injection techniques have, have uh, substantially improved. So credit goes to, to Dr. Santana over here for improving my technique and uh and that's uh again all knowledge that that we want to share with with physicians and, and uh, want to experience similar outcomes for their patients as well yeah yeah i think for us kind of doing this for a while now we kind of know learn a lot of these nuances to kind of make things better right because there's 
we've, we've done ways where we do interventional procedures uh, from an interventional point of view, but doing regenerative medicine, it's a little bit of a different uh, application to that knowledge base. And I think just having patients and procedures under our belt help us really figure out the best way to, to navigate that, that now. Um, the, and I'm happy, you know, it's one of these things where the hips used to be like, oh, I mean, every time I see hip, like, I mean, I, I, I can't tell you that it's, our outcomes are great, but now I can confidently say like, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah. And, and a lot of patients are able to avoid surgeries because of that and with a less and, and smaller recovery time. And that, that means a lot for a lot of patients. Um, recovery time, um, benefiting from a stem cell procedure uh, takes time. Uh, it's not a cortisone shot. Um, and it's not even a uh, hip replacement. Um, hip replacement patients uh, recover for the most part pretty quickly and feel, feel really good pretty quickly. Um, stem cells take time to, uh, to regenerate uh, and change those, the biology of the, the, of the joint space. Um, typical timeline for, for getting pr profound improvements, I would say is about three months. Um, patients uh, will feel slight improvements starting at a month with continued improvements in the second and then profound improvements by the third and final improvements at six months. Uh, so it is a, a procedure that while it saves surgical downtime, surgical risk, and, uh, and gives longer lasting, um, uh, you know, potentially curative type benefits mm -hmm. rather than cortisone, which is mass pain. Um, it is a procedure that, that needs to be done and understood that it takes time for your body to heal and what this, what this procedure does is it stimulates the body to, to heal itself. Yep. And then part of that recovery and healing too is, is physical therapy and rehabilitation. Because from what we've known before is that you know, with arthritis, a lot of it kind of becomes comes up from, from instability of the joint, right? So we have laxity or looseness in the joint, you have that extra play, and therefore accelerates the rate that the joints in the cartilage degenerate. So by by addressing the mechanical issue with the injection, with the orthobiologics, PRP, and stem cells, and then following that up with a robust uh, physical therapy program and exercise program to stabilize the joints as effective, and coupling that with the healing that comes with regenerative medicine, all, all of these kind of come together at the right time and, and makes the outcome much more optimal for, for everyone. Yeah. Um. I think we have a few minutes here. We can take some questions. Any other topics that you wanted to cover? So first question is uh, from Melissa. She's asking, does Medicare cover it? So I think we, I think we approached that, or, or unfortunately not yet. Um, and I, I would assume Medicare will be one of the latter insurances to cover it. Um, we have had some wins with some small uh, insurance players. Uh, probably the biggest being TRICARE yep. is starting to cover um, uh, platelet rich plasma. Uh, for specific indication, knees and shoulders being two of those. Elbows, uh, knees and elbows. Knees and elbows. Yeah. Uh, and uh, um, uh, there's also some smaller uh, self-insured plans uh, that have uh, insurance coverage for this, but unfortunately Medicare is not there yet. Yeah. We do accept Medicare, we bill and, and we'll um, offer treatments that Medicare does cover, uh, but regenerative medicine is just not one of those. Yeah. And depending on what your copay and deductible to, the regenerative medicine procedure might actually be, you know, more um, financially feasible, better than, than the insurance copays and deductibles too. So there's something else to consider. Uh, next question is, uh, how can regenerative medicine treatments help after a patella dislocation? Um, yeah, so it's a, so the idea with the patella dislocation is you have ligament laxity in around the patella, so it's your quadriceps tendon, your patella tendon, and also the collateral uh, uh, ligaments that's around the patella too. So part of the treatment that we would do is to treat those ligaments to make sure that we can get them back to stabilization and not make them loose. And then the, th the second piece of that is addressing the damage that's done by that dislocation. Usually when the patella dislocates, it runs over um, the, the femur, so it kind of runs over the cartilage there, it can cause degeneration in the, uh, cause patellofemoral arthritis and degeneration in that area, so that's not there that we treat. So regenerative medicine kind of talks about when we do these things, it's not just one area that we treat, not like in interventional pain procedures where you just target a specific area. We kind of look at the whole issue and the injury as a functional unit, so we tend to address all these areas that's affected because of that issue. So um, again, the, the outcomes for the patellar dislocation could be, is good. So as long as 
the we rehab that afterwards and uh, should respond pretty well to that. Let's see. Uh, can knee laser therapy and decompression be beneficial prior to a PRP and stem cell procedure? So, sure. Yeah, um, those uh, are regenerative therapies as well. Um, I describe uh, those sorts of therapies, be it hyperbaric oxygen, laser therapy, um, those sorts of treatments as being um, less potent in their regenerative capacity than uh, a quality PRP or a quality bone marrow concentrate or a quality lipoaspirate procedure. Uh, however, there are regenerative properties uh, gleaned from those uh, types of treatments. And uh, either if they don't work as a standalone treatment, trying PRP or a regenerative procedure afterwards can be a, a benefit. And doing those after or doing those treatments um, in conjunction with a PRP uh, can be very beneficial. We have incorporated two uh, regenerative therapies as a standard into our treatments. Um, uh, done a webinar on uh, shockwave therapy and uh, uh, EMTT therapy. Um, both of those we've incorporated already as a as a standard into what we offer when we treat our patients. Uh, but other things like lasers, I encourage my patients to uh, consider. We don't have those in the office uh, yet. Uh, but it certainly can be a benefit. Um, to me, it's a bit like a point system. If you think about needing 100 points and say uh, a laser treatment might get you 10 um, uh, and a stem cell might get you 90, uh, boy, yeah, combine those together and you got 100. So um, it's uh, augmentative, um, but uh, on many occasions, it's just not strong enough. Yep. Uh, question from Karen, how do either PRP or stem cells actually affect the arthritis? Does a procedure repair or undo damage, or is a very good uh, band-aid that jams pain signals? Great question. Yeah, so you want to start? Uh, you go. So I'll, I'll go backwards. So it doesn't just jam the pain signals, right? So that's more your typical pain management uh, regimen where you block the nerves to cause the pain. So the way that uh, learning about regenerative medicine actually made us look closely as to what is actually arthritis and how does it work. So the simplest way that we used to think as it used to think about arthritis is that it's just decreasing the joint space between two bones now learning about regenerative medicine and how all of these signals and all of this um this conduction of signals and um uh, and, and factor and growth factors in the body all orchestrate in order to create pain or lack thereof it's not just that joint space decrease it's also a lot of the the homeostasis that happens in the joint so one of the things that happens when you have injury is that the, the inflammatory component turns to destructive. So it starts kind of degenerating the joint tissue in the joint and that kind of causes uh, continued and excessive wear and tear. With regenerative medicine, when we inject the PRP there or the stem cells, it actually repairs that degenerative process in the joint, repairs that signal so that it stops that degenerative process and then reverts back to a regenerative process. Um, how do you yeah, uh, I mean, great explanation. Uh, uh, and, and you alluded to uh, being in the regenerative medicine space has had been a, a wonderful, I guess, uh, a shot in the arm to my inner uh, nerd in that it's got me back to basic science and looking at why things occurred in the first place rather than just taking what I was, I was taught as, as being gospel. If this is a diagnosis, this is the treatment. Um, asking the simple question, why? Um, and getting us back to what's going on and, and why are we implementing this therapy and not that therapy. So uh, that degenerative cascade um, is the pain. So as things degenerate and they're wearing down, that's when the pain occurs. So if you can halt that degenerative process, even if you don't regenerate things back up, if you simply just halt that degenerative process, you can get the pain to be in, under control. Uh, but that's not enough. We're trying to restore function and, and stability of, of the joints. Um, and our body's in this constant state of degeneration and regeneration. It's just that degeneration over time wins out over regeneration. What and, and how stem cells work, um, it's not as simple as we take cells from our bone marrow or our fat and put them in our knee, and those cells from our bone marrow or fat become knee cells. There's actually an intermediate step that occurs in that the cells that we take out of our bone marrow or fat actually stimulate our native cells to grow, divide, and heal. So not only do we stop that degenerative process, we then stimulate a regenerative process of native cells. Um, and that effect is called the paracrine effect. Um, the, uh, 
the, the way I explain this is, is, is a bit like a multiplication equation, uh, meaning if you wait too long and you have zero native cells left, and we try to put stem cells in there to stimulate native cells, no matter what number you multiply by zero, the answer is going to be zero. So getting back to step one and getting a good outcome is patient selection. Um, we need to do a, a thorough evaluation, make sure you have sufficient native cells left such that we can stimulate them to grow, heal, and repair. I like that. <clears throat> so a question from Bill. Uh, how long does relief last? Does the procedure need to be done after six months or a year, et cetera? Uh, another great question, uh, one that we get a lot. And reading the literature, it's all over the board. Um, a big part of looking at the literature is trying to evaluate the dose. And, and this is something we've talked about probably ad nauseum. Those of you listening, again, are probably rolling your eyes at this point. But um, dose matters. Dose matters. And if you don't inject the right dose, you're not going to get the optimal response. So the example is if you give you 20 milligrams of Motrin and it doesn't help your headache, that doesn't mean Motrin doesn't work for headaches. It just means 20 milligrams of Motrin doesn't work for your headaches. In my experience, you need 400 to 600 milligrams to, to successfully reduce somebody's headache. Well, the same thing applies for PRP, for bone marrow concentrate, for lipoaspirin. Um, and as we're counting our cells, tracking our outcomes, we are seeing a very distinctive dose response curve. So um, uh, the, the dose matters and um, making sure that what you're injecting has an adequate amount to get the, the successful outcome, um, whether that happens with and if you look at the literature, whether it happens with the, you get that cumulative dose with one procedure, two procedures, or three procedures, in our clinic, based on our, our ability to count cells, we're making sure we have an adequate uh, amount to get you there with one procedure. Okay. Now, 100% of the time, no. Maybe about 10% of the time, a second procedure is necessary. Typical, those are our patients who are starting at a lower barrier um, or lower bar. More severe and, issues. More severe issues okay. uh, that will re require a second procedure. How long will that last? Um, we're still tracking those outcomes. Um, uh, our best guess, depending on severity, depending on use uh, of the patient, if you want to be a runner, if you want to jump, if you want to work out heavy, if you want to be a basketball player, yeah, it probably won't last as long. If you're someone who's looking to simple walk for exercise, do household distances, be able to do stairs, sleep without pain, and, you know, I would anticipate that this would be a one-time procedure for you, and, and it shouldn't be something that you need to repeat. So right. it's a tough question to answer with just a one-word answer, yep. um, but uh, um, it should last many years uh, it's, if successful. In my eyes, success is not, yeah, we got you three months. Um, that, that's not a reason to do a stem cell or a PRP. We're looking for multiple years of relief and significant improvements in function uh, such that you know, you're able to do the things that your um, your goals have been set to do. Yeah, and I, I think that's uh, that's the thinking that you need to do PRP multiple times over and over is an outdated way of doing PRP. This was early on the days of general medicine when we didn't really know what the right dosage is and what's the right formula to do it. So in order to kind of hedge your bets, the idea is you do these you know multiple rounds of PRP, hoping that it's going to work. Um, and unfortunately, that still exists now because when we talk about doing things the right way and taking shortcuts, um, some practitioners would still use the old way of, of preparing PRP and not analyzing the dose. And, and that's why you end up having these multiple doses. But the way that we are looking at in general medicine now is it, it's we look at it as surgery. You don't want to go through surgery multiple times. You want to be able to go in there, fix the issue once, fix it the right way and get on with your life. So. Um, the, the, what we're aiming for is that, like what I can have you said, is that we want to address this issue and give you relief and function for years to come, not just, you know, it's a few months. Yep. Yeah. This isn't cortisone. Uh, this is a fix. This is the, the goal of regenerative medicine is the same as a surgical goal. We're looking at a, at a fix that's going to last you, um, and a prolonged period of time. I don't want to promise forever, especially if you're going to be active. Maybe time for one more. Let's see. Uh, oh, uh, uh, Tina's asking, what's the cost for the initial consultation? So the good thing is uh, it's covered by our insurance. So we're a medical practice. So as long as you have insurance, we can bill your insurance for your office visits. We can even give you options that your, that your insurance will cover. Um, there may not be regenerative medicine options. So in that way, you kind of look at both sides of it. 
and you can decide for yourself which option would be the best one for you. And if uh, by chance we don't accept your insurance or, or maybe you're uninsured and still want to come in for a consultation. Or from Canada that, or yeah, international. At international patients. Um, we do have out-of-pocket uh, fees. Uh, $150 is our consultation fee. And then if you decide to do a regenerative procedure, we'll apply that consultation fee towards your regenerative procedure. All right. I think that's all we have for tonight. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, wonderful questions, everyone. Hopefully you guys uh, got some information out of this webinar. Uh, we'd love to discuss your case with you, your knee pain or your hip pain. Uh, if you do, we'll be more than happy to, to discuss your case you know, on an individual basis. You can call us. The number here is 248-216-1008. Uh, we're the Michigan Center for Regenerative Medicine. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you.